1st October 1960 was the date Nigeria attained independence and since then up to date it was one experiment or the other democratically in between it was laced by military, military interruptions and people will say if the military had allowed the process to be maybe our democracy would not have been an unfolding or nascent democracy but the genius was broken on May 29th 1999 when the fourth republic struck since then till now we are doing 18 years and at the end of 2018 Nigeria will be doing 19 years of unbroken democracy that genius has been broken well within from 1999 to date four clear faces are within the picture we had Obasanjo, who blazed the trail in 1999. He had a 13 point agenda. He was succeeded by Umaru Musa Radwa, who had a, uh, a 7 point agenda. Though nature will not allow it, he passed on and good luck, Ebilo Jonathan, concluded his 7 point agenda. And when he was re elected, he came up with a transformation agenda. The turning point in history is the fact that for the first time in the history of Nigeria, it was no more uh, news that. We had a sitting government voted out of office when we talk about democracy, the power of the electorate. Good luck, Abilio Jonathan, at the end of his tenure, was voted out of power, and Muhammad Dubuari came on board. And on taking over the reins of power on May 29, 2015, he came up with three major issues, call it planks, to ensure security, the onslaught of uh, insurgency, to restore the economy, and ensure sanity anti-corruption. Now we are in 2018 already. Two years and three years into the administration. How well has it done? But before then, we shall be looking briefly. 1999 to date, how has the democracy been in terms of internal democracy? Are we building up somewhere? Are we sure maybe in 10 years time we'll really get it where the dream should be? Well, my guests, I have Dr. Peter Ademuete, Managing Director and Nentis Communications Limited and he's also a public relations consultant. Peter, thanks for joining me on it's Insight. It's my pleasure, man. And a happy new year to you. Happy new year to you, too. Johannes Tobi Wojuola is a lawyer and a policy analyst and also a member of the Buari Media Support Group. It was nice just to nice have you on Insight. Thank you. Happy and new year to you. Beautiful. <laughs> well, let me start this way. Um, this is the first episode of Insight for 2018. So what do you say to Nigeria? Let me start with you. Happy new year, Nigerians. Okay. Happy New Year, Nigeria. Okay, beautiful. I think it would be nice to put the record straight. Let us quickly do a summary. 1999 to date, what will you say about Nigeria's democracy? Well, I see that democracy being uh, deepened. I see our democracy being strengthened. Although we lost several windows of opportunity to have done better. Uh, one thing that is helping this process is the sophistication of the citizenry with uh, the explosion in ICT and then the realities confronting Nigerians. Nigerians now are more knowledgeable and the primordial sentiments of ethnicity, religion, sectionalism, those things are dying down. Nigerians now are getting to know that democracy is all about improving quality of lives of the people. Democracy is about my voice being heard and me making input into the process of governance. So now leaders now are being held progressively, are being held more accountable than it was in previous republics. So in summary, we're not there yet, but we've made appreciable progress. And as we make more progress, I know we'll get there someday. Okay. Well, uh, when we look at the picture of what democracy is generally, uh, government by the people, for the people, and of the people, is that what Nigeria has had? Uh, for me, not yet. But when we compare ourselves to other demo democratic nations, we're able to conclude that we're still a fledgling democracy. We are, we are still growing. We're still we're coming from, from histories of, um, of, uh, of, of monarchies where, where allegiance has always been to, to, to you know, to to some heads and traditional rulers and so so accountability hasn't been a thing that there was there was with the system transparency also was has not been a thing of the system there is a, it is a strong culture of secrecy coming also from a military background also so all these things are, are still there's still a mindset in the country where that 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 doesn't really appreciate democracy but 19 years so far 
we, we've come to see a change in perceptions. We've come to see more citizen participation in, in the different processes of governance. We, we've come to see more people asking questions on budgets, on, on accountability, on transparency of government processes. I, I, even in the election process, it, we, you can go around communities right now and people are already discussing the 2019 elections in 2018. Even as far back as 20, early 2017, the, 20, the 2019 elections were being conversed. People were already deciding who will be our choices and who, what will be the reasons for our choices. So we are attaining that point where we can now say democracy is now of the people. But is it by the people? And that brings us to the democratic process itself. Do our citizens really understanding the process of governance, are citizens really understanding <coughs> the, 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 the nature of voting, the, 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 the political system that produces those who we would vote for? Because as it is, whether we, we like it or not, we vote for those who are presented to us, not who we necessarily may want to say, oh, I can say, I mean, I want you to be the next president, but, but can I really have you to be the next president? It is who is presented for us. So that whole picture is getting clearer by the minute. Okay. We're not yet there. We are getting there, you know, slowly. And then we, we must also give cred, um, credit to, to the media. And that I mean both um, the traditional media and digital media. Uh, there's there's so much participation in the government in the governance process. We are now seeing government social media handles, Twitter on Facebook. Um, I can now tweet at a governor and tell him this is my disagreement with his policy, and then he responds to me and tells me this is why so 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 policy is ongoing. I can share my uh, my, my 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 pleasure at at government activities and and government response imagine being responded to on twitter but it's 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 the bridge of governance has been has been has been narrowed so there's a lot of interaction between government and the people and that is very positive for our democratic journey okay the bridge of governance and the government has been narrowed does that restore confidence well if it has been narrowed it should restore confidence but i don't see it being narrowed why do you think that way? <laughs> I see somebody being in a crowd and you feeling lonely. In a situation in, in, as, as it were in Nigeria now, democracy is about checks and balances. Democracy is about accountability. It's about transparency. Democracy is about freedom. And freedom must entail choice. And choice must involve alternatives. But what we see today, there is no, no choice. There's no internal democracy in the parties. Candidates are still being uh, imposed on people. And like our governors, let me be so particular here, they are like laws unto themselves. A in every state in this country, the House of Assembly is all a group of house boys to the governors. The judiciary, they are just like another appendage to the, to the governor. So the independence of the d different arms of government is being co has been compromised. Does that play out at the federal level? Well, at the federal level, um, before your hands comes in, I will say no. At the federal level, if you look at the National Assembly now, they are very robust. And we have a president that allows freedom. He, he permits what I call um, freedom even at his own peril to, uh, to deepen the discussion. He doesn't interfere with, um, unlike if you look at previous uh, National Assemblies, you see the president trying to uh, settle them at the back or intimidate people. But now if you look at the Senate, they have not always agreed with So if it is playing out the way it should be at the national level, yes. what should be done to ensure that this same picture is seen seamlessly at the state? And because now at the local government level, we are supposed to be having a presidential system playing out, though chairman, vice chairman, legislative, legislative assembly, and what have you. What can be done to restore this? Because <laughs> the process which uh, the, the amendment to the 1999 constitution has given space to even the state assemblies to have a voice. So what should be done to ensure that these three arms play out independently within the principles of checks and balances and, uh, how do I call it? Yeah, checks and balances. Well, it is doable. Now, the National Assembly, the, um, the amendments they proposed with the state assemblies are meant to concur. It do mostly in, in entrenching these free, uh, checks and balances. The autonomy, financial autonomy of the judiciary, financial at the state level now, financial autonomy of the state house of assembly. A situation where is the, the is the governors that hold the yam and the knife. If you don't throw the lie, you die of hunger. 
And also number two is about mobilizing the citizenry to hold the governors accountable and even the, the members of the House of Assembly and judiciary accountable. Third point, a uh, part of the, um, the, the proposed amendments is that INEC should conduct local government elections. Have you noticed? Every state in this country that is doing local government elections, the party in power must do what? Must win, win all, the, all seats. the seats. Now, look at the, the, the federal level. The president himself went to Anambra to campaign for the APC candidate. Was he not there? But they have up, up won the election. And that is the beauty of democracy. People should be able to choose who they want based on some parameters. So a situation in the, con in the country now, the governors came out with one fraudulent uh, joint allocation, uh, joint account committee. What does that mean? You get your money. Why didn't the, uh, the, the president collect all your money you know, in Abuja now? And then be giving you peanuts. Your money is given to you. Now, the way it is now, the governors collect the local government money in the name of joint allocation accounts committee or whatever name they call it. And no local government can do any project again because the governors have the money. They eat the state allocation and also eat the, the local government allocation. And there's no development. So constitutional amendment is the way to go. Okay. Thank you. Now, let's come down. Let's look at, let's x-ray what 2017 was like within the three planks of this administration. Economy. <coughs> now, let's start with the economy. When the government came on board, Nigeria uh, slided into recession, and somewhere along the line, the manager of the economy, minister of uh, finance, CBN, and other stakeholders within that ambit, from within the public and private sectors, came together and suddenly they said Nigeria has come out of recession. So, looking at it, 2017, and moving on to 2018, where, where we are already, what, what, what are your comments? I think when we look at you know the three planks like you said and um perception of this of how the government was going to manage the economy i'll tell you that the average nigerian had a fear of a buhari handling the economy they said buhari would be perfect with security anti-corruption would also be amazing but what would happen with the economy this is not this doesn't seem to be his forte but by and large we've seen the economy actually being handled by this administration in a very, very interesting way. Coming from the recession, we, which was as a result of, of course, the 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 crude the the drop in um, price of crude oil and also the activities of militancy that you know crippled Nigeria's income, um, FX foreign exchange income. Then. By September 2017, the country had come out of recession. What led the country out of recession? Two things were key. It was the increase in the, in the price of crude oil in the markets, in the international markets, and also the diversification and transparency and integrity of the government. If we had not seen integrity in the management of resources, in the, in, the, in the proper allocation of resources to the right channels because once a country is in recession, you have to stimulate the economy. You have to put money into the hands of, 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 of people. There has to be industrialization. There has to be uh, a lot of activities going on in the economy to put money back so that there's some form of economic activity that takes the country out. We were able to see that in play. We were able to witness 1.2 trillion naira being dispensed for capital allocation, which is the highest that we have ever seen. It may have not uh, trickled down so much that citizens would have a lot of money in their hands, but it was able to offset a lot of debts. It was able to put money in the hands of construction companies. And you see, the trickle effect of, a of, of, of paying a construction worker or a construction company money is that he goes to sites, he employs his workers, he's building the house, the tiler who is selling um, who is selling tiles, he gets money. The man who is a carpenter, he gets money. His wife who owns a shop gets money. So, so there's so much economic activity, and okay. that helped us out. Integrity was key, like I said, because it 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 took it took the government not spending on unnecessary items to be able to stabilize the economy. We didn't we, we, we were able to see a lot of a cut in, in unnecessary expenditure. We were able to see the TSA being implemented 
um, I mean properly implemented. We're able to see the BVN catching up with a lot of criminal activities, uh, when I mean in fraud. And that, that led to a bit of a, a, a lot of um, a stability in, in terms of the economy. So the economy was not the way we wanted it. It was not uh, a a boom, so to say. It wasn't, I didn't get 10 billion. <laughs> Nobody got, it wasn't like there was so much money in the economy, but there was so, a bit of stability. Yeah. And generally, I mean, in the international community, the economy, economy and politics, politi politics and economics around the world was very unstable and it okay. affected Nigeria. Okay. Uh, I, I know Adamu want to differ. I thought I could take it. Uh, you want to say something? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Okay. Um, I will agree to a point, but not completely. Go ahead. I'm listening. <laughs> now, the economy last year was turbulent, very volatile, not only in Nigeria, it was global. But government response to managing the recession was not too fantastic. I'm talking as a man on the street. I'm talking about the deliverables, key performance indicators, what I can feel, what I can touch. Like Johan said, for an economy in recession, you have to spend. You have to stimulate production, especially local production. That was not done. If what the Senate said was true, that uh, implementation of 2017 budget was at 50, capital project was at 15%. Although the president came out to dispute that figure. But for me as a, and others, the masses on the street, statistics is nothing to us. When you say the economy has um, come out of recession, and I see I'm feeling the economy bite, and everybody, nothing is working, I mean, any statistics you are reeling out does, they, they will not make sense to me. I feel that what the government should have done in the previous year is to, in terms of capital projects, Yes, some pay, contracts were paid for, some domestic debts were settled, but I think government should have prioritized on activities that will have more mass impact and multiplier effects in terms of spending. Because anywhere in the world, in the, for economy in recession, you have to spend your way out of recession in creating uh, uh, productive activities, stimulating demands, and even local consumption. Okay, now that we are in 2018, yes, and you set what they should have done in 2017 to get it even better. Yes. So now we're in 2018. What will you say so that they get it right? One, they should begin to prioritize what economic activities. They should, the priority should go to produ production activities that will, for, for example, agriculture. I know where yeah, you talk of Anchor Borrowers Fund, how many people have benefited from it? It's for you know, can we, can we maybe step up the game? You look at solar minerals in this country. Everywhere people are doing legal mining, and the wealth of this country is being frittered away. Can government now come with more uh, better policy implementation, even in terms of empowering our local registered miners, so that that way it is more streamlined. In terms of agriculture, I know in those days that government used to have a CBI used to have a policy that would, that used to compel commercial banks to give certain percentage of their loan portfolio. To, for, to, for agriculture. Can we do that better? In terms of agric input, I'm talking of fertilizers, fingerlings, uh, seed, seedlings. Now, if you will agree with me, nothing has changed. The way our forefathers used to farm, you see how we are farming. Can government come up, come up with maybe mechanized agriculture, improve seedlings? You have International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. You have several research institutes in universities. Most of those findings are locked up in their drawers. Can government maybe, uh, not maybe, embark on massive agri-extension services whereby these modern farming techniques, with these modern seedlings and, and the fingerlings... But I've heard the Minister of Agriculture severally talk about the fact that they are trying to de-emphasize the who and knife to the mechanized farming. Fine, but since he said that, ha have you seen government or even partnering with the... I know government cannot do it alone. In partnership with the private sector, saying, okay, we want to mechanize agriculture. We want to improve agriculture beyond talking. And let me be honest, there's so much talking in this government. So, but if all this is done in 2018, do you think it will get better? When it will get better. Okay. It will get better. These are low-hanging fruits. They are quick wins. I mean, agriculture has a, a, a shorter cycle. If you are not entering into plantation agriculture, as you are in 2018, January now, and you now start with like recruiting agri-extension services, you start 
creating synergies, linkages between research institutes, universities, and the farmers. And you start uh, uh, working with cooperative societies, commodity associations. You know, these are things in the first quarter of the year that can be done in terms of ma mass mobilization okay. and distribution. Okay. And it will work. Let's proceed now. Okay. Now let's look at security. But for obvious reasons, I, I won't start with uh, you. you <laughs> let me start with you. Short, on the day of inauguration, May 29, 2015, Mr. President gave standing orders to the service chiefs that they should re relocate to the theater of war mm -hmm. in the Northeast. And along the line, somewhere last year, 2017, I can't remember the month now, uh, the chief of defense staff handed over Boko Haram flag to Mr. President or the Army High Command. I can't remember the seven, but I know that they said Boko Haram has have been defeated. But on the flip side, the critics are saying Boko Haram has been defeated. How come we still have pockets of bombings here and there? If they have been defeated. So, looking at security, what will you score and what should government be doing to, to cover more mileage as we, have, we enter into 2018? Um, thank you for security. We are not yet there. The government has tried. I must commend the president and the armed forces. They have really tried. But they want the, the question that, that I keep asking, along with many citizens of Nigeria, is. How many times will Boko Haram be defeated? Like Shekau. How many times will Shekau be killed? You see a phoenix that has more than nine lives. So the communication around Boko Haram, I'm not a military person, but I'm a media person. I'm a public relations person. The communication around security, especially the insurgency in the Northeast, has been very, very inconsistent and very divergent and contradictory. Now, you look at the, the, um, the decision of the governors recently authorizing the, the president to withdraw a $1 billion from the SS crude account. You saw the, 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 the negativity, the wave of opposition or criti criticism around it. If you say Boko Haram has been defeated, why do you need that? what do you need the money for? Number two, when they talk of Sambisa Forest, oh, they are taking over Sambisa Forest. Then in the next one week or two, we say, oh, they are, they, they are going to Sambisa. So for me, I'm not a military person, and I'm not very conversant with the geography of the Northeast. But if you tell me that this war has been won, I take it that you've been able to uh, win that war, not just cutting the leaves or the stems. You have gone to the roots and uprooted the, the roots. So that one, we are not yet there. And as to what they can do to get it better, I'm not a military strategist. I cannot um, comment on that. But what I will want the, the, the military and the defense, the ministry in particular, that handles the communication around insurgency in the Northeast, let there be more consistent in their message. Okay, it was not only in the Northeast. We had pockets of resistance or agitations from the Southeast, yeah. South South. Do you think the government did well? Yeah, in the, in the, yeah, in the Southeast, the government, um, when the Python just danced, then by the time there was even no dust raised, all the noise died down. And I also saw that many people were encouraging the, the um, agitation. The moment government came and said that organization is a terrorist organization, everybody now would root to their shelves and say, oh no, we will not support that. What again. about the crocodile smile? Well, the crocodile smile worked. And actually, one of the things that this government did right in managing the agitations in the Niger Delta is the dialogue, um, dialogue um, management. Okay. Where the vice president himself, I mean, he took risk. He went there, met with the people, felt their pulse. And I'm even getting to think also that government should dialogue more with Boko Haram. Because bullets and bombs do not, are not uh, delivering what we expect. Like in the Niger Delta, right from the Yaradua's time, when the amnesty program came, in fact, that was one of the best Yaradua did for the country. Okay, so the crocodile dance or whatever. Crocodile smile. Crocodile smile. smile. <laughs> that pantone well, dance. Well, dance. <laughs> crocodile smile do better. I look at Vice President Trips. You, know, you, know, you have major, three major things. Yes. Uh, Lafia Dole, not east. Mm -hmm. Crocodile smile, south, yeah, south. And the pantone dance, the well, the south, east. For me, oh, <laughs> it's not the crocodile uh, smile that gave us peace in the Niger Delta. I look at it as dialoguing with the people, feeling their pulse, 
is uh, gauging their expectations, discussing with them, and okay. also taking practical let, 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 let me hold you there. Let me hear the thoughts of uh, uh, Johannes on security briefly, so that we we'll cover the area before the time. I think uh, security, like with us, when it comes to the insurgency, has been a plus for the government because it's um, and just for for the sake of you know putting it in context, the the technical defeat, the word technical was was categorically used by um, by those who were in charge of the communications for security, was was suggesting that. Boko Haram cannot have that same might it had to stage attacks, to mobilize and take over towns. They took over Madala, Bama, and so many towns, you know, about a or two years back. The 14 local governments were under the control. I mean, they were collecting taxes okay, you're, you're from the you're people. You're a point then. Now, so in 2018, what should be done? Of course, we, we, we should we should look at the consolidation on the success. You see, you there was a there was a comment made by uh, one of Link, Abraham Lincoln's generals, and he said, "We have won the war. Now lead us out of it." It may sound antithetical, but it suggests the fact that a war is not won by merely uh, you know dismantling or the whole architecture of of the of the other army. But there are so many other things you will need to do. In terms of intelligence gathering now, mm. there needs to be a high improvement in that by our military. In terms of, uh, of, of equipment, a lot of the, um, the, the areas in the, in, the, in the northeast, especially the places that were previously occupied by Boko Haram, still have mines. Those mines have to be unearthed. So there's still a lot that needs to be done. We need to be... And that, that I, th I believe that is where the funding comes in it's about consolidation on the successes you you must we we have to win the war and and win it properly okay. we need to we need to be able to stop those pockets okay. of of suicide and suicide bombings does does this only have to play with just government government no citizens have a, sure, have, a, have, sure. a, have a great role to play sure, yeah. we need to see gov because i i read i, I was reading on on twitter about uh, about a, a young a young lad who, who noticed some some suspicious movement around uh, around some bushes and he informed the community leaders and they found out that there was an ambush that was being planned by by boko haram citizen engagement and citizen relationship with our our security forces have to be improved okay, let's look at anti-corruption the one that has been in this public space i say uh, the campaign was carried even on, on trees by hawkers along the street anti-corruption anti-corruption the debates the tantrums connections disconnections they connect to disconnect they disconnect to connect <laughs> now let's look at anti-corruption how was it like in 2017 and what direction should it go as we move on progressively into 2018 uh, the fight against the corruption by the present government is commendable but that fight must be done objectively and the fight against corruption must also benefit the citizenry. What do I mean? If, if this government spends all the time chasing the thieves, those who have looted their money, you, in, I have not stolen money, yo. I haven't stolen money. And then the government is not thinking about me who has not stolen money because you are pursuing thieves in the bush, then something we need to have a rethink. Like I've said, I commend the, the anti corruption fight, I commend it. But it must be done objectively. Number two, the bulk of the money, um, uh, the looted uh, monies being recovered now, I understand part of them will be used to fund this year's budget, which is commendable. The third point I want to make, when I'm talking about doing it objectively, we on the street, we feel that this government, the fight against corruption, is not, it's been done in an ambivalent way. We are people who are part of the government when they, they are caught by President Buhari's uh, searchlight on corruption, perfumes are sprayed on them to go and enjoy their loot. Then those who are not in government or those who are not part of government, when they are, uh, they are caught being corrupt, insecticides are brought and sprayed on them. I cite two, three cases. Number one, they, they, they sacked SGF. 
it took the president a very long time. Even when but they should... I hope, I hope if any of it that is in court, we shouldn't talk about it there because we don't is, it, have, uh, is the HF in court? I, would, I won't be sure, but no, he's not, I'm not. No, he's, uh, okay. he's actually under investigation. Okay, he's not in so, court. He's not. So he's not. That, in court. So I, mean I can point. make yeah. fair comment. Yeah, this is fair comment. Yeah, I'm, we're talking about the process now. I am not condemning him. I'm talking about the process. Justice being done should be seen to be done and on time. Now, it took the president a long time after all clamoring before the committee was set up, headed by the vice president. Then. He went on medical vacation, came out, the report was submitted to him. Well, you may call it a due process. But since he has been um, relieved of his post, I am not aware. Apart from saying, oh, oh they are investigating him, I am not aware. The issue of Mena, I mean, somebody was dismissed from service. The, the noise that surrounded Mena's surreptitious reinstatement and then paying him 20 million naira. Although when the team broke into the open, the president ordered that Mena should be sacked. But where is Mena today? He has disappeared into thin air. So what I'm saying is, in summary, is that yes, I commend the war against corruption. Because corruption has killed many of us. With, with corruption, we, will know we can never make progress. At least in this past year, all the money, the, the depots of stolen money, in Kaduna, in Osborne Towers, everywhere, people now are afraid. And the money is being recovered and is being used now to fund the economy. But I think government should do more okay. in fighting corruption, regardless of whose horse is God. Okay. Let me just defer a little. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think. Uh, I, I don't, that's, that's a bit I, over here. I, I don't think uh, the 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 sacking of uh, of Mena is perfume. <laughs> Neither do I think the sacking of the SGF was perfume also, because I think that was that was a hot spray. And you know, first of all, he was suspended. Then he was relieved of his duties. And you're talking of the number three man in terms of the executive ranking, the, the, the secretary to the government of the federation being sacked. It was, it was a big deal. It, and it is still a big deal in terms of the fight against corruption. He's been investigated. And of course, we, 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 one of the things I want to particularly even comment relates to this is the fact that we need to build stronger institutions. Sure. Yeah. Without stronger institutions, any fight against corruption after the exit of Buhari, a first term or a second term, would collapse. Sure. Because institutions should do their work. If the president has to order the EFCC, the ICPC, to go after a person, then there's a problem with the institution. The institution already has a mandate. We were excited when we were hearing the FBI was investigating Hillary Clinton, even while she was Secretary of State to uh, Obama. Because that is what an institution should do. If there is an allegation of corruption, do your work. You don't have to wait for the president to give you an order. And so we need to be able to build this mentality into our institutions. Not to wait for body language. Not to wait for the president giving his nod. Okay. Before institutions should go and do their job. We need to institutionalize the fight against corruption. And I will tell you that for a good start, we have the TSA which has been implemented. In the civil service today, a lot of those monies that used to be paid into one account that um, in terms of one fine or the other, that you pay it into one director's account uh, where the director is the only signatory in a government agency. His director is the signatory to the account and he goes to withdraw the money. It has ended. We are not having... Are you sure we don't, have to, we don't still have pockets of them somewhere? Well, because well, we hear of violations of TSA in some well, you, agencies. You, you see, that's, the, that's another thing we should also have in, in our minds. That corruption is not something that... Uh, that you kill it's not like an animal that once you kill it is dead okay. it's like a hydra it's going to bring its head yeah. in different forms again yeah. it would and that's why it must you must continue to bring str build stronger institutions okay. you must continue to okay. reform how our let me, institutions let me just, uh, hold let, let's take it from this end now uh we're in 2018 and uh, democracy in nigeria inching into 19 years now in conclusion any hope across board for nigeria is hope lost? All hope is not lost. We, we have made progress actually in the past in the past year, and I think if government will listen to the suggestions we are proffering here, and suggest and listen to the citizenry, we will make progress. I, I agree with the issue of building institutions, the judiciary. Any fight, you know, the judicial process we have is too cumbersome. Okay. So we must have judicial reforms. The president should even start judicial reforms because that's what is frustrating the fight against corruption. 
because of cumbersome judicial processes here and there. One of the so, first steps the Chief Justice of Nigeria, mm. Justice Walter Nogan, mm. took was to set up an anti-corruption, very strong one within the judiciary. Well, I mean, I will tell you, I was very excited when I heard it. Only to discover that it is not that they are going to create any court. They designate some judges to handle anti-corruption cases. I'm talking of process now. The judicial process is too cumbersome. We copied our laws from the UK. Those guys have moved on. If you steal money, that, like all the fight, the president has been fighting for the past two and a half years. How many convictions have we got? Expert motions, technicalities, jurisdiction, this and that. So we must have judicial reforms that will simplify our judicial process. Okay. I think he that that, that summarizes it all. Okay. We need we need reforms that that they go to the roots of the workings of our institutions. Reforms that would strengthen our institutions to do their job and do it well. Yeah. I think another thing that we should be looking towards in the coming year is, is to look at our, our, our the apparatus of, of, um, of justice. And I mean the police, yeah. the prisons, the courts. Okay. We need to be able to, where funding is required, put in more funds. We need to improve the legal system that, that allows these um, this, this agencies and institutions to work, we okay. need to we need to improve those laws. The laws are are, are very archaic, okay. to be honest. Okay. We need to also let, look let, at let funding me, for our let police. Let me this one question before the, the director rounds off us in this segment. I heard the vice president, Professor Yemi Ushibaju, in a documentary uh, titled "The Other Side of Mr. President," and he said what surprised him about Mr. President as Muhammad Buhari is the fact that they like, keep reminding him each time they are discussing. Say, look, I'm no more a military ruler. I'm not a civilian ruler, and he. He insists on due process of the law. But, but a good number of Nigerians out there believe that Mr. President professes being a Democrat, but he's not a Democrat. What's your last sentence on that? Do you share that same view? Well, I will quote a philosopher who, say, who said, to be is to be perceived. It means the president is not communicating his new being into Nigerians. Just a few words. So? Let him communicate more and demonstrate more that he's not a, a thoroughbred Democrat by his words, by his actions, and even by his communication team. Okay. So that Nigerians can feel him as a democratically um, elected president, practicing democracy, strengthening and deepening democracy. Okay. I will only add to that. Okay. Uh, because that, <laughs> indeed, they, they, we need to see that side of him more and more often. In, in, we need to show and not tell. Yeah. Uh, two, we need to. We need to have uh, the culture of secrecy around the president okay. itself, okay. because no matter how much how open the president is, his the people around him, the the government agents and uh, ministers, and even the civil service itself, it already is in a box of of secrecy. Uh, it's a culture already. We need to unbox that that attitude. It. Yeah, we need, to it. It. we need to now have people now do things. It's because it, no matter what the president does, it still trickles down. Okay, I'm afraid I have to stop here. Dr. Peter Ademwete, Nentis Communications Limited, and uh, PR Consultant, it was nice talking with you it's on this pleasure. very first episode of Insight for 2018. It's my pleasure. Amy. Okay, and uh, Johannes Toby Wojola, you're always there. It was nice also talking with you. It was my pleasure. We hope and believe we had it insightful on this very, very, first episode. Very. Well, if you ask, I believe this first episode of Insight was quite insightful on this segment. Up next on the